It's good to see you again. You glad to be here? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm glad to be here. I, it seemed like it's been a fast week, but uh, I've enjoyed it myself. I hope you've got some enjoyment out of it. Uh, but uh, uh, don't you enjoy seeing those young people sing? I love that, seeing these young people sing. That's just a blessing, and y'all keep singing for the Lord, and uh, you'll never go wrong there doing that. But, uh, well, if you uh, have your Bibles with you tonight, here with you, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to John chapter 17, John chapter 17, verses 20 through 26 tonight, uh, entitled my sermon, The Prayer of Jesus. Now, while there are some 650 prayers recorded in the Bible, None match the splendor and the majesty of this one. We read often that the Lord Jesus went out and prayed for lengthy periods of time. He usually sought out a mountain. In fact, I saw where one commentator came out commented that it seemed like that Jesus must have asked when every village he come to, where's the nearest mountain? Because it seems that that's where he liked to go pray. But anyway, he prayed all night before he uh, chose the 12 disciples. And so we know that he prayed often and prayed long, but we actually know very little about the contents of his prayers. But we see here in chapter 17 of John, his prayers recorded. The greatest prayer ever recorded is found in, the, in our text tonight, and it takes about six minutes to read the whole chapter out loud. Uh, not much length to it, but there's a lot of depth to it. But this prayer takes place between the upper room and the Garden of Gethsemane. After sharing the Lord's Supper with the disciples and having washed their feet and exposing His betrayal, Jesus and the disciples made their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And as they traveled, Jesus had shared much with them. Now He pauses to pray. He prays for Himself in verses 1 through 5 as the crucifixion is quickly approaching Him. He prays also for His 11 disciples that uh, we see here in verses 6 through 19, uh, as they endure the departure and him talking about his departure and they to continue on his work. But tonight we're going to look at verses, uh, the last verses here, 20 through 26, I believe it is. And uh, it's about praying for us, for you and I. It is a prayer for future believers who will receive the gospel of Jesus Christ and open their hearts to him and receive his salvation. That's who this last part of prayer is, and that's what I want to focus on here tonight. Now, I want you to understand, this prayer is for future believers. I hope you're one of them. If you're not, you're not included. I, don't, I may sound harsh, but it is what it is. This is a prayer for future believers. Again, let's look at verse 20, and it says, Neither pray I for these only. Now he's talking about neither do I pray for the disciples. He just got through praying for those. That's the 11 that was walking with him uh, between the upper room and the garden. So he says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on, uh, on me through their word. They that, are, uh, they that all may be one, as the Father art in me, and I in thee, and they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou givest me, I, give, uh, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and, this have, and these have known thee that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for another evening, Lord, to come and share. Father, I pray, Father, your sweet spirit in this place. Lord, I pray you give me clarity of thought and speech tonight. And God, we ask your forgiveness, Lord, of the many sins, Lord. And Father, I pray, dear God, tonight to be used as a vessel in your hands, Lord. Just speak through me. But God, I pray for this congregation, this pastor. Lord, I pray that they do have revival. 
God, I pray you send it. I pray you stir their hearts. I pray you move them. And I pray days to come, Lord, they'll be still excited and, and praising you, Father, for the blessings that you've given them, Lord. But, Father, we thank you for this hour. And, God, we just pray your sweet spirit move in and just take over. And, Lord, touch every heart, every family. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. The prayer of Jesus. My first point is this. He prays for us. As we look here at verses 20 through 21, it was a prayer for all future believers. Never, neither prayer I, I, for, I, for these alone, he says, but for them also which shall believe on them through, through their word. So Jesus was not only praying for the disciples, but those who would hear the gospel that the disciples uh, would share, that disciples would proclaim, and also through the written word of God. So Jesus was the incarnate word and the living word, and the disciples would preach and share that precious word. But the gospel being preached through the apostles and by the scriptures which they had uh, were used by the Spirit of, the, of God to write, they have provided the source of gospel truths for you and I. I, I thank God, you know, you, you look at the Word of God and, the, and, and what's written here, especially the Gospels. You know, it was the Holy Spirit of God that stirred these men to write the Gospels, that brought back to their remember, uh, to their members and everything that Jesus said that recorded the Gospels for you and I. And it's through this that we uh, are saved through the Word of God, through the preaching of those men, those early guys, and the writing of their Word, and down through the ages, spreading that, that Word, that precious Word of God, and we have become saved. And even think about it, before the apostles died, and of course we know that most of them died as martyrs. Before they died, they taught, they preached, and they founded the church. Praise God. They obeyed the Lord Jesus Christ. They gave an account of their life uh, of Christ. And they gave an account also uh, of the death of Christ. They gave an account of the resurrection of Christ. They gave an account of the ascension of Christ. And, and, uh, uh, and they also give an account of everything that Jesus taught. They recorded the miracles of Jesus. They even recorded their, their own miracles where Jesus gave them the power to go out and heal. They recorded all of the theology uh, significance of everything that Jesus said and did. Praise the Lord for those early disciples. Praise God that they were obedient unto Him. But now Jesus prays for us. Thank God for those apostles again. But again, note here that His prayer sweeps into the future beyond the apostles and it gathers up people of all ages, of all countries, of all nations, of all cultures, all the believers of all history, and it gathers them up and He prays for them. The Lord was facing the agonies of the cross and the weight of our sins, and yet He took time to pray for us. I like that. How amazing. It's really amazing to think about it. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus was praying for you as, as He was going to the cross of Calvary to die for you. Hmm. You ever heard that song, uh, 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 he had, when He was on the cross, I was on His mind? Well, it's the truth. That's the truth. Uh, that's the truth. When, when we, well, even before the cross, you think about it, we were on His mind. Though we were not born. Some 2,000 years ago, we still uh, were on the heart and the mind of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How wonderful. The eternal God had already set His affection upon us before we ever was born. <laughs> that, that's amazing. God loved you before you were ever born. The Lord Jesus Christ cared about you before you were ever created in your mother's womb. How amazing. He knew about you 2,000 years ago. He knew about me. I think it's a matter of unspeakable joy that, that each Christian, however humble or, or unknown to, to man or, or however poor or unlearned or despised, can reflect on this wonderful blessing that he was or she was uh, remembered in the prayer by, by he who, who, who always is heard by the Father 2,000 years ago. My goodness. Jesus prayed for you 2,000 years ago. Now hear how Jesus loves us all his people with the same affection too. Note here that Jesus loves all his people with the same affection. He doesn't love you anymore than he loves anybody else. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? You may think you're a nobody, but in Jesus' arms, you're somebody. I promise you that. 
Nobody's no better off. Than, I want you to know you've heard of that. The ground is level at the cross. Amen. It is. It is. I've run into some people who think they ain't. I, 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 you know, I thought they're a little bit upper than, than, than the rest of the world. But, you know, I've even read some people in the congregation that think if you didn't go to their congregation, you weren't part of their church, that they have a little, just a little bit better Jesus than you do. Well, it didn't work that way. I don't care what they think. Amen. Jesus the same. Jesus is equal. He loves us all the same. But, but note here how Jesus loves us all. And friend, He loves you as much as He loves those disciples that were there, that with Him. That's what the Scripture says here. I love this. Look at verse 21. That they all may be one as thou Father art in me and I in them, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. I want you to, we're one in, 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 the, in the arms of Jesus. We're one. He loves us all, each and every one. And I thank God for that. I praise the Lord. I, I'm just, I, I get excited thinking about that. But note also what they said in verse 17. He does even, uh, uh, he does even now in heaven, uh, because it says it in the book of Hebrews, he ever lives to make intercession for you and I. So I want you to stop and think about that. 2,000 years ago, Jesus prayed for us. As he was going to the cross of Calvary to die for us, to die in our stead, Jesus was going to give his blood for you and I, give his life for you and I. And, and, and so we see here also in Hebrews, it says that he's still, he's still at the throne of God interceding for you and I. He's there praying for you now. He's there right now, even as, as He always has been and will be uh, for, since 2,000 years ago, praying for you and I. Friend, He has you in His heart. He has me in His heart. He carries us to the throne of the Father that He might plead on our behalf for all the good gifts, the best gifts that God could give us. My goodness. That shows how much He loves us. That shows how much He loves you. Or, I, I, that's wonderful to know, isn't it? The Lord Jesus Christ loves you. He's sitting by at the right hand of the Father right now and He's interceding for you and I right now. He knows what's going on in your life. He's doing His best to work things out for you. But I, I want you to... I, I thought about that, but when I worked this sermon up, this was a couple of weeks ago, and I was out mowing my yard and I got to thinking, reminiscing on this sermon, you know, meditating on it. Uh, you know, it's like chewing the cud. The old cow just chew on it, you know. And I got, and I got to thinking about Hebrews there, that, that verse there where he says, He ever lives to make intercession for us. Hmm. I got to thinking on that. And I got to meditating on it, and I thought about it. I thought to myself, do I ever live for him? Do I ever live to be his witness? Do I ever live to talk to him, uh, to others about him as he lives now talking to the Father about me and for me? Do I ever live to share the gospel of Jesus Christ? Am I doing everything I can all the time as much as I can for him while he's doing the same thing for me at the throne of God? I got to thinking about that and it made me feel a little... Heartbroken there, a little burden in heart. He's given me his all before the Father. What am I giving him? Is he getting my best? Am I giving the Father my best? When he's there interceding for me, I, I, you know, I, have, I, 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 I just put myself under the gun. Lord, help me to do better. Lord, help me to do better. Lord, I want to be a better witness. I want to live better. I want to be a better person. I want to be a, a better pastor. I want to be a better husband. I want to be everything better for your name's sake. Hmm. My second point here, it was a prayer for oneness. This is a very special prayer, and, and he's specifically praying for you and for me and every other believer through all of redemption history. As Jesus prays for all who will come to save, uh, to saving faith in Him down through the ages, He prays for unity among His children. Jesus doesn't just say it once, but twice in the Scriptures here in John 17. Not just once, not just twice, but five times. Verse 11, be one as we are. Verse 21, twice, that they may all be one. Last part of it, that they all may be one in us. Verse 22, that they may be one as we are one. Verse 23, that they may be made perfect in one. 
Christians are redeemed by the same blood, are going to go to the same heaven. They have the same wants, the same enemies, the same joys. Though they are divided sometimes by denominations, yet they will meet at last in the same house of glory. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I got brothers and sisters I haven't met here, here, but I'll meet them up there. We belong to the same family and children of the same God and Father, and there are no ties, no tender as that which binds us in the gospel. There is no friendship, no pure or so pure and enduring as that which results from having the same attachment, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. Christians in the New Testament are represented as being uh, uh, indissoluble unit. In other words, we are, we are part of the same body and, and members of the same family. And on the, on the grounds of this union, uh, we are exhorted to love one another, to bear one another's burdens, and to study the things that make for peace and things wherewith uh, one may edify another. Christ desires for His people is that they be one. Let me ask you a question. Why do you think God leaves you here? What is the purpose of you being part of South Alma Baptist Church? Why does God lead you? I'll tell you why He leaves here. One is we're witness to the lost and dying world. But being a good witness to the lost and dying world is being a good family member of the house of God, the church of God, and, if, and that means we're getting along, loving one another in spite of each other. Amen? That's truth. That's true. <laughs> Let's be honest. If it wasn't for the love of Jesus in our hearts, we wouldn't get along as well as we do. Some of us are a little bit peculiar, aren't we? No, you ain't talking about me. I'm talking about, no, I'm blind. <laughs> That's the truth. But it's the, it's, the, it's the blood of Jesus. It's the love of Jesus. It's that Jesus in our heart. That's that Holy Spirit of God in our heart that enables us to love one another, put up with one another, pray for one another, care for one another. Amen? Amen. And I want to tell you something. There's no other way, it, I'm telling you this, if you want to make your pastor proud, if you want to make him glad and happy, then you love one another. Amen? You love one another, and that will bless his heart, I promise you. I promise you. Mm. Christ desires for his people is that they be one. That is, He wants us to walk in unity, uh, which requires us to love one another more than we love ourselves. That's the new commandment of the Word of God, isn't it? What does that mean? I want you to know, understand that that love He's talking about is a sacrificial love. It's a big order. Yes, I know. But what does it mean? It means giving. It means giving. It means helping. It means doing something. It is a love that means action. Amen? That's what it means. It's a word that, it's a love that means action. So you just don't say, back, well, okay, brother, sister, I'll pray for you. No, it means you do something about it. More than just prayer. If you're physically able, if you're financially able, if you could do something, put action to, to, your, to your prayers, amen? Yeah, pray, but put some action. That's what it's talking about. When you care for one another, when one of you hurt and everybody rallies around them, when one of you have lost something, everybody rallies around them, Amen? That's that oneness. That's that love that's required. Yes, it's a big order. I mean, think about it. We are guilty. Think about this. We are to love one another. Look what it says. As the Lord Jesus loves us, as they love each other, the Father and the Son, that's a big order. Love Jesus as He loves us. Love each other as Jesus loves us. Hmm. Now, it's amazing that he loves us. We're guilty of murdering him. Aren't we? I mean, think about it. We are guilty of his murder and he has forgiven us. That's our pattern also, forgiving one another. He's our pattern. And don't come up with this, well, I'll forgive, but I won't forget. Then you just admitted you ain't forgiven. Don't be one of those. Jesus says that they all may be one, even as thou, Father, art in me, I in them. Here is our analogy. Here is our example. 
Whatever kind of unity he's praying for, it's the kind of unity that exists between the Father and the Son. How amazing. That's God's requirement for you and I. How can we do this? It begins with our individual unity with our Lord. In other words, it's impossible if we don't have Jesus Christ in our hearts. It's impossible for us to love one another and to care one for one another, have that sacrificial love, if we don't have that right relationship with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which deposit within our hearts the Holy Spirit of God that enables us to love and to care and corrects us and leads us and guides us. That sweet Holy Spirit of God, we need that. And without it, we can't love one another. We can't, no. Hmm. It's only when, with God, that we can set aside our selfish pride, strive to be hum, humble and, and be considerate of others. We are to strive to have the same attitude Jesus who uh, submitted himself to the Father's will and left the glories of heaven to become a man and pay the price for our sins. Only when we have the same attitude as Christ, we will be one in the same way that the Father and the Son are one. Only when we become a body of believers, having been placed in Christ by the word and the work of the Christ on the cross, being born into the kingdom of God, then we will be one with the Father, one with the Son, and we can be one with the other, one another. Hmm. Verse 21 through 23 there, he prays for our mission, which is to reach the unbeliever. <clears throat> the purpose of our unity. Why is unity so important? That the world may believe, he says there in Scripture. We are a living advertisement for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are His billboard. Whether you like it or not, you are to be a billboard for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are His advertisement to the world. The unity that we are to have with one another is to be a reflection of the unity of the Father and the Son. This, in turn, is to be a witness to the world for Christ's sake. It is to be a witness to everyone who walks in that door. When the world sees the people of God, they either see the presence of the Lord or the presence of strife. They will either see love or, or animosity. The Bible says that mutual love, unity, will be our calling card. Our calling card is, is that mutual love, that caring for one another, that loving for each other. That's your calling card. You want to make an impact on your community? Listen to me. It's how you love one another. It's how you care about one another. He desires the saved to stand together in the faith in order to be an effective witness to the world. So Jesus prays that the unity of Christians would make such an impact that the world would believe in His divine mission. So it's our, it's our love one for another that's going to reach the lost. Now I want you to listen to what I just said. I, according to the prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ here, it is our love for one another that's going to make an impact in this lost and dying world. It's not our programs that's going to reach the lost. It's not the music that's going to reach the lost. It's not all this stuff going on that in the churches today like our coffee shops and our donut shops. These are not going to reach the lost. But according to the Word of God, the prayer of Jesus, He says it's our love one for another that will make a difference of the lost world. That's not my words. That's his words. You think you got to get all these programs going that, that's, that this is what's going to happen? By the way, it upsets me when I have somebody visit my church and they ask me, what you got for my family? I give them one answer, one word. Jesus. Jesus. You don't come no better than that anyway, does it? Right. Amen. By the way, that's the best thing you can give your children and grandchildren. Other than cars and motorcycles and mini bikes and four-wheelers and anything else you can give them, taking them on 
uh, excursions every weekend, forsaking the house of God. You get them to the house of God, you introduce them to Jesus, the greatest gift in all the world, eternal life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm. When there is unity in the church, it's a testimony to the identity and the nature of Jesus. Our unity, faith, and love stands as a strong testimony to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, a holy church, which is a united church, is a convincing argument that there is a Savior who delivers from sin. How else is the world going to believe? Friend, if you tell me, if you tell me or you tell someone that Jesus has saved you, I hope you really I hope you really live like it. I hope you can really be seen in you because I want to tell you something. If they don't see holiness in your life, you'll never convince them that Jesus is real. If you never show them the love of Jesus, you'll never convince them that Jesus is real. The next point is that the world may see His glory in us, it says in Scripture. Look there in verse... 24. He gives his glory to help encourage us in unity. Now the glory which you, 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 you give me, he says there, the glory which you give me, the glory that God the Father gave to this God the Son, now there is a lot of different opinions on this glory that Jesus receives and gives. But I believe that glory is simply the Holy Spirit of God. Well, where do you get that? 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this. But we all with open face behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed in the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Verse, uh, 1 Peter 4.14 says, If you are uh, reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you for the Spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. So what is that glory? That, that glory is the Holy Spirit is what I believe. I mean, I know you can look at the commentators and they got some other opinions, but I just believe it's the, the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, and God the Father endowed Jesus with the Holy Spirit as He came and got baptized by John. And I want you to know, when we get baptized under the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that Holy Spirit comes upon us and it never leaves us either. Amen. Stays in there to help us, to guide us, to show us the way of life. And we give our hearts to the Lord, folks. He's, he gives us the glory, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this glory helps us to be united. Go right back again. It's, it's the Holy Spirit of God. His friends, it's the work of the Holy Spirit of God in our hearts that helps us to love one another, unite us together as a family of God. We couldn't do it without the Holy Spirit, I promise you. So Jesus prays that the unity uh, among believers to come would, would demonstrate to the world that Jesus loves His people, loves them after the pattern of God, uh, 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 the Father loves for God the Son, and have loved them as you have loved me, Jesus says. Do you get that? Do you see what this is saying? I, this is so amazing that God loves us as much as He loves His Son. His Son never failed Him. His Son, his son always obeyed Him. His Son died on the cross fulfilling the will of God. And every day it seems like uh, uh, we're getting out of the will of God. And we're doing everything wrong and sinning in our lives. But yet the Bible says He loves us just as much as the Son that never messed up. Amen. We mess up all the time, but God says, Father, I want you to love them as much as you love me. Show them that love. I like that. I like that. I mess up, but he still loves me as much as he loves his son, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Church, uh, if I come into this church, I want to ask you, if I come into this church as a stranger and I come for a couple of services uh, and I focused on you, what would I see? What would I see? If I just come in the church and I come several Sundays and I just sit in the back and I just watched y'all, what would I see? You see, the lost is looking for love. 
according to the word of God here, it says that we'll reach the lost by our love for one another, that unity that comes in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And when we're showing that love for one another, we're showing that unity as a church, as a family of God, that's what will make a difference in these people. I want to tell you something. There's a lot of lost people out there that don't have family. There's a lot of lost people out there that are lonely. There's a lot of lost people up there that's lived in nothing but turmoil all their life and don't know what it's like to be loved. Love. You want to reach the lost, it ain't your programs. It ain't going to be your music. Huh? And I know Danny ain't setting up no coffee shop either. But it's your love that you are showing from one another to one another in here. It's a billboard. It's a testimony, a witness of the power of Almighty God. It was just a look around at us. If he can bring all you together and make you love one another, that is a miracle, ain't it? <laughs> it's the truth. Because if it wasn't for Jesus, somebody would We'd be, we'd be looking down the shoulder at one another. You see the way that marshal dress. I, I can't stand. They're always running their mouth. I would say, we we all on and on, just like I'm telling you the truth. But what is the dividing difference? It's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ that puts up, helps us to put up with one another's peculiarities. I can't even say the word. In Jesus. We have a perfect unity, it says in Scripture. You see, they, they, they that may be made perfect, he says there, complete in one is what it means. Not that we are individually perfect because we're not, but, but that our union is perfect as we are complete in Jesus Christ. And for the second time here, Jesus says that, that this is to be a witness to the world. It's twice now that he says this is to be a witness to the world. It's important. It must be. He says it twice. Our unity is very important in winning the loss. We are responsible to live in such a way that the world can see the Lord through us and in us. Hmm. My last point. He prays for our future, verses 24 through 26. That we will be with him. Now, I love this. The word will means to purpose. It is used for the will of God, which is unalterable and firm. It's fixed. It is the will of God and will come to pass. Jesus is saying, I am declaring that it is my purpose that everyone who receives me will be with me in heaven and will behold my glory. In other words, if you, have, if you are saved, you're going to go home. You're going to go to heaven. You're going to behold that glory. Now, I, I touched on this last night. I, I can't think of anyone who would, who would want me around all the time. Matter of fact, I, you know, you think about it. You know, just a little time together is, 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 is all right, but every day, all the time, we get a little bit edgy toward one another, it's, and we need a break from one another. But you know what I see in this verse? Jesus says, Lord, God, Father, I want them with me all the time. I find that wonderful. I find that amazing. Who wants me around all the time? Jesus says, I do. I want you to be with me for eternity. He wants our eternal fellowship. It's really is overwhelming. Father, I desire that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, he says. It's not, is it not remarkable that the glorious son of the living God prays for his father that he may have us with him? Is it not a staggering thing to think about our sins nailed him to the cross and he still wants us to be with him? Our sins nailed him to the cross. All that pain and the agony that he went through, all the shame, the beard pulling, the spitting upon, the smacking by the soldiers and the spear that thrust into his side and the nails that's driven into him on the cross and yet they are caused by your sins and my sins and he says, Father, I want them with me all the time. I want them. Jesus pray, I want them. Hallelujah. Amen. Folks, if you just get that in your heart and your mind and soak on that a little bit, think about that a little bit, it'll keep you revived. 
thinking, Father, you know, I mess up, but my, my Father, my, my Lord and my Savior, He still wants me. He wants me. He says here that He, he wants us and that He wants us to show us His glory. Ah. <laughs> oh. I can't wait to see His glory, amen? I can't wait to enter into His glory. He wants to show us His glory. He came this earth and lived in poverty. He was born in a manger, ticked, uh, tripped off to Egypt for a while to escape Herod and lived there in Nazareth. Uh, uh, and then was a carpenter, lived in a carpenter's home and lived at the age of 30 with being unrecognized at the time. But when he steps forth to assume his full purpose, he was attacked by the devil in the wilderness. The leaders of his day tried to stone him, sought to catch him in a, in a criminal worth of lies or something to put him to death. But finally they arrested him and false charges beat him within inches of his life, forced him to the cross and to carry his own cross where he crucified. They crucified him naked before a howling mob. Boy, how they shamed him. And he did that for you and I. Then after the resurrection, he sent his disciples and followers into the world to be offended and be treated and be abused. All those disciples, the majority of them were martyrs. They were killed, put in prison. And folks, I want to tell you something. They're still happening today. There are those over in the Middle East, and Lord knows what's happened over there since we've pulled out of uh, Afghanistan. I read one article where a church, an underground church, the whole church was killed. Why? Because they proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. My goodness. Jesus declares that our mutual sign to the world is that love one for another. Jesus said, I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it that they love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. Now he's ending up his prayer saying this. He knows his time on earth is almost over. He knows that the life expected of the saved would require more than than, than we possess physically. If we were to make it, we would need a source of strength and comfort. And this is, is found in His love. This strength and this comfort is found in His love. It's, it's found at the foot of the cross when the Holy Spirit enters us. But He's saying here now that what He wants the world to see is that same love of the Father be inside of us. The same love, that's what he's saying here in this last verse, that same love. He says, I, I have declared unto them thy name and, and will declare it that they love wherewith thou hast loved me. He said that they would love with the same love that you have loved me. Hmm. You know how to get the Father, God the Father to love you? Very easy. Love his son. Tells us that. You read this in, uh, in John 17. I'm back for you. It's just, it tells you there. Just as plain as day. Is that if you want the Father's love, if you want the Father's passion, if you want the Father's personal care for your life, is to love Jesus. And then he says here, though, that he wants that love of God, the God the love that God has for him to be in us that we would love one another. It is such an encouragement for someone to say, I'm praying for you, but to think that Jesus prayed for us, how much more, how much wonderful. And looking at the prayer of Jesus reveals his heart and his soul to us. We know how deeply he was thinking of us as his time of agony was about to begin. Just a few minutes from the Garden of Gethsemane where he would go and sweat great drops of blood. But before he does, he prays for us. He prays for you, my friend. And what is that prayer circled around unity and love? What does he want you to have tonight? He wants you to have love for others, the same love that God has for him, God the Father has for him. He wants us to have that one for another. Isn't that something? 
You say, well, why do I need that? He done told us that too. It is our calling card. It is our witness. It is the billboard of God to tell the lost world there's something real here. There's something happening here. There's something for you here, and that is the love of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now let me ask you something. Do you love your brother or your sister beside of you more than self? Because that is the calling of God upon our lives. It is the love that sacrifices. It is the love that says, brother, if you need me, I'm coming, I'm running. Whatever you need, I'm going to help you. Church, if you want to keep revival, if you want to get revived, there it is. It's the love of Jesus in your heart, one for another. And I find it so amazing. But Jesus knows it all. The Lord knows it all. He knows what the lost world needs. And we're always trying to plan up something to reach the lost. Jesus just says love each other. And that'll get them. Love. It's a powerful thing, isn't it? Brother, you come. Danny, you come. I'm going to let you close this tonight. Bell and I is close for just a moment before he, Jack leads us in a song. I want you to think about something. Two questions. Number one, are you living to see his glory in your life? And secondly, is there someone you're having difficulty loving? Take them to Jesus. Bring them to Jesus tonight during this invitation. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, we're reminded, Lord, that our calling card is loving one another and loving you first with all of our heart, mind, body, and soul. Lord, I pray that you would help us tonight, Father, to accept the call and commission that's been given through this message tonight to love one another. Lord, I pray for those tonight, Lord, that are standing in this church that are living for themselves instead of to see his glory. I pray that they'd surrender tonight and get back to their relationship and fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ and experience the glory of God in their lives. And then I pray for those this evening that are standing here in this church that uh, are having difficulty loving someone. Just help them to have the grace tonight to walk that aisle and take that situation or take those persons to Jesus and see what he can do. Have your will, have your way now, Father, in Jesus' name, amen.